I'm going to give you the uh, mic back, uh, Dr. Khan, and then you can discuss about Hyperfine and its applications in neuroradiology and what's on your roadmap specifically for neuroradiology. As a neuro ICU physician, I'm extremely excited because the portable CAT scanner changed the way I practice medicine, and that was a big deal. And I'm looking forward for your MRI machines to show up on different places. Yeah, absolutely, right? I think the vision for Hyperfine really started with Dr. Johnson Rothberg. Uh, who made who, who invented the next generation sequencing and really made his money in that. And then also in 2011, started uh, Butterfly Networks, which was the point of care ultrasound. And uh, Jonathan approaches the same the problems more from, you know, somebody in his life, somebody he loves has a problem and he kind of fixates on it and tries to solve that uh, and, uh, and takes advantage of, you know, what I call vertical integration. And taking advantage of things that have happened in the industry outside of healthcare and how do you bring those learnings into, into another domain. So that led to in 2014, this idea that, you know, there's limited access to high quality care. There's so many people who are living in chronic uh, diseases that can benefit from better way to look at the disease through imaging, through sensing, whatever you want to call it. And then just, you know, two thirds of the world just doesn't have access to imaging, being able to monitor continuously and and do intervene. And all these things are large, expensive, require expensive installations, requires experts to use it, and a lot of training, and then are only available in specialized centers. And then that, that is kind of the, what the vision was. And, uh, and the, the conclusion came during that initial discussion in 2014, 2015 was that how do we come up with a non-radiating uh, high advanced imaging solution to the patient's bedside? So if you look at MR 1.0, these were permanent magnets, low field, started in the late 70s and the 80s. And then in 1986, Picker, which became GE eventually, commissioned the first uh, superconducting magnet 1.5 Tesla. And then all the research in the ultra low field completely stopped and people start focusing on high field uh, to get imaging. So these you know, machines got bigger, required special uh, rooms, special HVAC units, and a lot of the other issues that are with, um, uh, you know, advanced imaging. And then people kind of completely forgot about, uh, you know, low dose, uh, sorry, low frequent field strength uh, MR for a long time. Uh, I think almost like 2015, where the interest in that again started. And then, so we call what we call now MR 3.0 uh, is bringing that MR capability uh, with advantages of, you know, 40 million increase in uh, compute power, you know, 20 million increase in uh, microelectronics and uh, material science and, um, you know, signal processing and all that stuff that has happened over th three decades or four decades and bring that into uh, to the patient's bedside. So we've released our first portable MRI scanners, FDA cleared in clinical use today, you know, just, just keep deploying <laughs> If you're following us on social media, you can see, you know, pretty much weekly, we are deploying new devices everywhere for clinical use. Um, and, then, and then we had to really think through from scratch, right? I mean, we had to really, really think through how to think about a device um, that can be affordable, that can be portable. So the first thing we had to figure out is how do we address the requirement for Faraday cage for an MR scanner? Like, how do you remove that? And the reason for Faraday cage is because there's so much RF and electromagnetic radio frequency noise in the environment. Uh, and that's what you're trying to shield for. So you can detect the subtle signal that comes from the hydrogen atoms in the body, like in water molecules, basically in your body. And so we invented noise canceling technology the way your headphones have noise canceling. Uh, we have noise canceling technology that cancels out all the environmental noise. So the monitor in the room, the respirator, uh, the, the ventilator in the room, uh, you know, all the other gadgets and metal does not cause any interference. And, uh, you know, MR is very sensitive to temperature. So we had to figure out how do we measure ambient temperature and correct for that as we are doing imaging. The second biggest problem we had to solve is how do you build a magnet, right? So typically because MR is a low volume device, uh, people make magnets by hand and it takes six months to make one magnet. And if you import them or you manufacture them somewhere else, the transport cost to secure the magnet and all the safety that goes with it just becomes really, really hard. So we decided like, okay, fine. What if we didn't import the magnet and we actually create an assembly robot that assembled it on the assembly line. So we are not importing raw magnets. 
So this is what you're seeing right now. So the blocks are the raw ore uh, converted into blocks that get shipped so in a box, right? So there are magnets, they're just metal. So no need to do any kind of safety transport of this stuff. And then the thing that is hanging from the ceiling here, this is the, this is the two robotic arms here. This one magnetizes and this one is the big one that actually cures the magnet on a plate for the magnet that builds. So we reduce the manufacturing time from six months to six hours. And that's how we can reduce the cost, you know, 20 times reduction in cost of manufacturing magnet and then speed in manufacturing also. So we not only did we invent the technology to do the scanner, but also the technology to build the, the whole machining and the tooling and manufacturing process, we had to reinvent that. I mean, that's how Tesla has evolved, right? It's not just building electric car, it's all the manufacturing of electric car is also what's led to it. And what that enables is scenarios like this, where you can bring the MRI to the patient anywhere, no issues with electronics, IV pumps in the rooms. You know, the image on the left is the North Shore University Hospital is the first COVID deployment we did in April of last year. Uh, this is a neuro ICU patient was a COVID positive patient, had altered mental status changes and they couldn't figure out what to do with it. Uh, and when, we, when this scan was done, there were 110 patients on ventilators that didn't have a transport ventilator to take a patient down to radiology and plus risk of COVID and all the other stuff. So this was being used over there. The image in the middle is in the, ICE, in the ER at Yale. I mean, look at all the like, room electronics and metal in the room. That physician with the iPad is controlling the scanner. It talks wirelessly to the scanner. That's where the console is. Console is an iPad. And by redoing the magnet, re using a permanent magnet and redesigning the grading, grading coils, we reduce the power requirement to something similar to a coffee maker or a blender. Right? You can literally plug it in into any wall outlet you want. And we also had to rethink how the user interface works. Right, so we had to make it really simple because this could be used by you know, radiology techs and MR techs. It could be used by a community worker in sub-Saharan Africa and community center, right? So we had to think through how would somebody do it? So it's a single button scanning. The scanner figures out uh, where the patient's head is. You just hit play and does all the th uh, 3D sequencing on its own. You don't have to go plan the sequence. It does all auto alignment. It has motion detection capabilities. Uh, so to generate diagnostic quality images every single time. And because it's wirelessly connected, data goes immediately to a physician's phone so they can interact with it. We also do what is called progressive rendering. So as scan is happening, as case space is getting filled in, we're generating images. So even though the scan time can be, you know, five minutes to 10 minutes, but you are seeing images within minute, two minutes of scan starting. Uh, and then, you know, we have AI, AI applications through the cloud to help with, uh, you know, assistant diagnosis. Uh, as well as uh, viewing capability through a browser-based packs. And obviously we connect to local hospital packs also. Our first clearance is for neuro applications. So we do T1, T2, uh, Flare, and um, uh, DWI with ADC map. Uh, we also have our AI application cleared through FDA that does volumetrics. So volumetrics of the ventricles, the brain, midline shift and things like that automatically. Uh, and we are working on a lot more things in the future. Our, we are active trials going on for other body parts. Uh, so for C-spine, for extremities, upper and lower extremities, we have trials going on on contrast agents. Uh, so dedicated contrast agents for our uh, device is not cleared through FDA yet, but uh, we're looking at different contrast agents, including ferromoxetol, spion agents, and higher laxic degadolinium for those applications. And we are also trials going on for intervention. Because of our low field strength, we don't have those issues that you see with metal going inside uh, uh, MR uh, environment right here. You can see the needle very clearly going through a lesion in this phantom example here. And just imagine opening up image guided, you know, procedures on the patient's bedside. And you can have a scanner right at the bedside and be able to do procedures with image guidance right at the bedside. Um, I mean, we see uh, Hyperfine as an ecosystem, not just a device. You know, we'll keep building new devices for interoperative use, emergency use, screening applications. We'll keep supporting them with AI applications to us to better image quality, reduce imaging time, image guidance, even disease detection. And then we'll have a consumables such as contrast agents and, and procedure kits to be able to do image guidance intervention in the long term. So it's, we think of ourselves as a solving the entire ecosystem of care continuum from monitoring to sensing to diagnosis to therapy. And MR is just our first uh, forte in the, in the vision of where we are. Uh, I don't know if we have time to go through some clinical cases or should I stop?
uh, if you have time, sir, feel free to go ahead. All right. So this is we this will is a... record it, put it up for all the people to consume later. Sure. So um, so I'm going to start the story in um, in uh, Blantyre, Malawi. It's one of the sites that has uh, one of our scanners. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Terry, uh, Terry Taylor, who runs the Blantyre Malaria Project. They had a GE uh, MR scanner that broke down two years ago, and they just couldn't get parts or anything to, to repair it. And they were really desperate for getting um, uh, more scanners. So th this is in uh, Mercy James uh, Institute, uh, where they're running this uh, cerebral malaria program. And uh, our scanner was delivered to them um, on March 11th. And here's her tweet that uh, they scanned the first patient four hours after they uncreated it. Nobody from Hyperfine uh, went with the scanner. So we, we trained them all remotely and then Dr. Taylor's team uncreated it and uh, scanning, were scanning patient and saving lives uh, four hours after the crate arriving. I mean, this is unheard of even in the US to be able to do imaging this fast for an MR scanner. So here's the story of a 13-year-old Malawian a boy who presented hospital with acute, profound, uh, you know, decrease in consciousness. Obviously, this is a malaria clinic, right? So they were concerned about cerebral malaria. And here are what the images are. I'm not sure if Dr. Sarvath wants to comment or somebody wants to comment what this is. Uh, again, 13-year-old boy with hyper intensities, uh, mostly in the uh, posterior uh, portion of the brain. So this is non cerebral malaria, right? This is press syndrome. And press syndrome is a benign entity. It's uh, good if promptly treated. And all you have to do is reduce the blood pressure. And they immediately recognized it, uh, treated his blood pressure and uh, patient recovered, right? So here's a classic example of a place where there's just no access to imaging. And you know, without doing MR, you would have no idea what is going on with the brain, right? There's just no way. CT would have been normal. Everything else would have been normal. Labs would have been normal. And if it is not treated, you would have had pretty bad outcome. Uh, here's another one scenario, male presented to MGH. Um, this is now a US scenario, right? In the emergency department with acute change in mental status. Initial workup was done with non contrast CT. Uh, patient was transferred to the ICU. Uh, nothing, there was some hemorrhage detected on CT and I'll show the images. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, the EBD was placed to, to, for supportive care because they thought nothing can be done for this patient. And then, you know, while this patient was being stabilized to figure out what is else going on, why the bleeding started, they decided to do a soup uh, scanner, uh, one of our scans. So here was the initial interparenchymal hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage. You can see some midline shift. Uh, Diagnosis was hydrocephalus with interparenchymal and interventricular hemorrhage. But here's our scan, right? So as, as you can see, there's some high signal on flare uh, on, on the right side, but very classic wedge-shaped, high-intensity diffusion variant imaging, hypo-intensity on, on flare. And this would have demonstrated, you know, focal territorial infarct. It was not recognized by neurology staff over there. And this was, you know, raised diagnosis of superimposed vasospasm due to the hemorrhage. And the patient had balloon angioplasty to open up the vessel and recover the stroke, right? So this, this, was, not, this was not a candidate for TPA. Right, and this is not really required mechanical thrombectomy. This is more of a vasospasm pulled due to hemorrhage causing an infarct. Again, you know, providing immediate uh, direct results for, the, for this patient and changing uh, care. Here's an example of another Malawian boy with uh, obstructive heart suffers because of uh, pendemoma internally. I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, it looks like there are a lot of questions. Boy, this is extremely fascinating. And we'll, uh, you know, just to remind everyone, the innovation doesn't come just because of the actual portable MRI. There's a whole new manufacturing process that got innovated, a whole user experience that was defined, a whole new use case scenario that was redefined. And by the way, if you follow Hyperfine on social media, the way they are actually selling the device is actually amazing as well. That's a total disruption of the industry as well. So go ahead and make sure you follow on Twitter and LinkedIn. And then the way they are actually making it available is just fantastic. So uh, just to make that additional point, uh, and then uh, we'll get to the questions in a minute. If you don't mind, if I being the moderator, I can ask the first one. So 
as you can see that, you know, one of the biggest advantages is that you can actually keep it in a room without any magnetic interference. And the second one is you can potentially even, you know, do some uh, needle base or even metal base uh, while you're getting the MRIs done. One of the key things is that, that when you are actually doing this, uh, is the image quality up to par? And if so, how did you achieve it? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit selfish here. I'm also going to bring in some one of my other team members. So Dr. Eddie Knopp, who's a senior medical director on our team. Uh, Eddie was the director of neuroradiology at NYU for 20 years. So he is the expert in neuroradiology and, and uh, pretty much taught most people uh, doing neuroradiology in the country, right? So um, I would have, I wanted Eddie to talk about how he made the switch from academia to <laughs> clinical practice to upper, to upper fine too. But, but I think the thing that we've done is as I said, right, I mean, um, there has been so much improvement in electronic signal processing techniques that is not applied to, to uh, permanent magnets or low field uh, imaging at all, right? So we basically did that. If you look at images done at 1.5 Tesla in the 90s and look at 1.5 Tesla images now, field strength is the same, but look at the image quality, how it has changed, yeah. right? So we basically brought in you know, better sensing capability, better signal processing capability, into the place and now in the future we are adding more machine learning and deep learning capabilities that's my expertise into the into the plane to even improve image quality even more. again we are not doing at the image level we are doing all this stuff at the signal level at the at the uh, when we are getting the data from the patient's body right we're doing it at that level so that it's less of the you know image based artifact getting introduced it's more possible eddie you want to comment on on image quality so my view as a clinical diagnostic neuroradiologist is that this is not a replacement for 1.5 or 3T, but as Khan has indicated, it can give you answers to specific clinical questions in situations where you may not be able to get that answer, or it's just too difficult and dangerous for the patient to get them. So with knowing the question you want to answer, you're going to get that answer. You know, do you need the resolution of a 3T to see a large territorial infarct? You need the resolution of a 3T when it's three in the morning, you're in the ICU, the patient's a post-op, and all of a sudden there's a significant change in mental status. Did he bleed? Is there a significant mass effect? Did his vents blow up? Does he have an extra axial collection? We can answer all of those questions without putting the patient at risk and getting that answer in a phenomenally timely fashion because you don't have to transfer them down. That's how you have to think of this system. That's how I think of this system. Beautifully put, sir, including in the neuro ICU, you, you cannot tell me like how many times I have to go through root cause analysis just so that the patient had to go to a CAT scan and the EVD came out. Right. It's just, okay. it's just uh, your, your, the use case scenario that you defined is, is extremely important. And the example that Dr. Khan just suggested that the DWI flare mismatch, how you can actually go ahead if it was a balloon angioplasty or intra-arterial TPA because it cannot see, you can actually get to a lot of uh, limb and life, right? I mean, it's literally directly limb and life as far as the stroke is concerned. So that's great, uh, absolutely. There were a few uh, questions about uh, cost and availability in Pakistan. And then uh, I'm grateful that you have been answering that in the chat That's as well. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Danish, do you want to uh, have some questions, sir? Uh, no, I mean, I don't have, but I can definitely see all those use case scenarios popping in my mind as a neurologist when I'm on call and, and all the challenges of a patient, especially in, uh, you know, ICU and neurocritical care setting. But I think uh, the advantages are beyond uh, just use in, in US and some of those examples were so beautifully shown by Dr. Siddiqui. This will revolutionize the imaging across the world uh, and, uh, and not just uh, change things in North America. Thank you. I'll, I'll give an example. Unfortunately, we did, the scan wasn't used for this. I, so I get a text message from Dr. Aisha Kamal from Aachen. So they have a, a scanner there for pediatric um, infant asphyxia and neural brain development sitting in pediatrics. So she's texting me seven in the morning, Pakistan time. The patient has arrived in the ER in the middle of the night, 65 year old with new onset tremor. And um, ER admitted it. They even though neurology wanted MR done first to figure out what's going on. All the labs are normal, but the patient's cardiovascular status is getting worse. Altered mental status is happening, weird neurological symptoms, and they have no idea what is happening. Now the patient's unstable. They can't take him to the MR or CT scan, and they're totally blind, right? So the option is dual LP to see if there's encephalitis happening here because symptoms are so weird. 
is a tumor, you'll find tumor cells. And her thing was like, can you convince feeds to let me do this use the scan <laughs> in the ICU and AKU? was like, yeah, why are you calling me? <laughs> but anyway, just give you an example that how much she has immune and AKU has, and which people are fighting about, you know, where the scanner should be. And um, it's just just tremendous amount of use cases that come on, come in, uh, you know, once you start to realize that you can actually do this. Uh, yes, I mean, the use cases would be amazing. And, and understanding, again, what Dr. Knopf said is to make sure that you have the question in mind. And it's extremely important in a value-based healthcare model that we actually have to start asking the question before even ordering the imaging and then deciding on the tool. I'm going to ta- uh, give the mic to Dr. Tipu Siddiqui. He has a question. Sir, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. So this is wonderful. I overslept, so I didn't see the first part, but I was really looking forward to and Dr. Siddiqui needs to be congratulated obviously and he is uh, I, I should say miles ahead of what we know um, but I had a question that uh, is more for the AI and, and, and you know Junaid you are very interested in that too but is that can, can we look at uh, tissue can we look at autopsy samples and use microscopes to apply AI to uh, um, using, I don't know what paradigms are being used or what algorithms to try to bring up the signal that would uh, actually lead us to a better understanding uh, at a molecular level or at a um, uh, level that would uh, tell us more about the pathogenesis, uh, not the obvious stuff that we see in uh, on uh, pathology, but um, uh, in terms of using various kind of immunostains to, <clears throat> to see what is the real commonality, not just the morphology. Yeah, I think, you know, I had a project in Microsoft, what used to be used to unsup- based on unsupervised learning, right? So the idea was that other features, so, so, so let me track back here, right? So for AI algorithms to be successful, it's all about the data it's trained on, right? Because you don't actually sit and write an algorithm, right? You basically tell the machine like, here's data, this data has this thing positive and this data is normal. Now you go figure out what's the difference, right? So literally no human sits and programs this stuff. You basically feed data to, to, to known algorithms that then figure out what the differences are and then build the model by themselves. That's why it's called AI because humans not creating those algorithms, machines creating the algorithms based on data that was fed to it. So the things you're talking about, right? So a lot, lot of work that is happening right now in AI is all about based on what humans can see. So what happens is the way, the way imaging-based AI happens is a human goes and labels the data set or traces where the pathology is. And we tell the machine like, hey, this is lung cancer, this is breast cancer, this is this, this is that. And these are normal, these don't have the pathology and now go learn what the difference is. The true thing you're talking about requires what I call unsupervised learning in which humans can't see it, but we know this patient had this thing but we don't know what were the features or features are not visible to us on imaging, pathology, what are you gonna call it? And then tell the machine like, can you figure out are there any features at the image level, at the, at the signal level that can actually detect the difference between this and the normal data set versus that, that we have not been able to see ourselves, right? And, but to do that, you need 10, 20 times more data. So just to give you an idea for unsupervised learning model for one feature, they require 1,048 data sets, right? And if you're looking for something that has 100 features, there's 1,048 times 100 is the data sets you need, right? So like if I'm looking at particular disease and disease in prevalence is one in 100,000 patients, you pretty much have to have data from thousands and thousands of institutions across the world to be able to even build that model. So I think the middle biggest bottleneck in the scenarios you're talking about, everybody wants to do this, that's the vision of this, is the lack of availability of data to be to, to do that kind of detection using AI model. I mean, as I said, right in Xbox, we ended up generating 500,000 data sets to train those models to be able to work how Xbox you know, Connect worked out of the box. And, um, and I mean, we have, I'm bringing some of those techniques into Hyperfine to do this stuff, uh, but we still, we'll see how we are successful or not. We, we don't have the answer yet, but I think that's the promise of AI. You know, and I see AI as a lever for us, right? As a physicians, you know, it's something that we use to 
instead of seeing one patient at a time, improving one patient in a day, you can now touch thousand patients and improve thousand people's life at the same time. And that's that's what the what AI brings in and enables us to scale really fast. Hey, could yeah, you say, words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. So from sample what, sorry, a thousand. Sorry. Could you sample? Um, I mean, obviously, the limitation you pointed out in terms of uh, access to uh, numbers, but let's say within each individual, uh, one can one can get a, a, an improvement of signal if if one sample not one specimen but uh, neighboring specimens. Let's say in the motor cortex or some other place. Uh, you have 10 samples from each patient, or from each person, or from each mouse, and then you do a, let's say for the sake of argument, 500 of them, uh, you have already increased it to tenfold or more. Um, does that help, or is it not uh, a useful? Pair? It's magnitude more than that that's needed to train. So what do we, so where do we generalizable across patients? You have to have multiple patients. I'll tell you what, we used to run into problems when we didn't. So, so when in our early data sets that we trained the the thing that I showed in my data size on detecting human anatomy, we had data from GE scanners, Siemens scanners, Philips scanners, but for whatever reason, we didn't have Toshiba scanners. So our accuracy was ninety six percent on those scanners. But as soon as data came from Toshiba, our accuracy dropped to thirty percent. As a human, I couldn't see a difference between the CT scan done on Toshiba versus Philips or. GE, but our algorithm would completely fail because it, whatever it was learning, the feature was learning, it was drastically different for the machine and just would not work. I mean, even the same thing we've seen in clinical, right? MGH did dense breast cancer detection. Their accuracy was 90, 92% in dense breast. And then when they apply the same algorithm on data from, um, from Brigham, the accuracy dropped to 12%, right? So, so there's a whole idea of generalizability that requires multiple patients, multiple instrumentation, so that uh, the algorithms that are built by the AI can actually work across patient population, across practice scenarios. There's so much variability in MR. I mean, the reason you don't see a lot of MR-based AI detection application because, because a lot of vendors have IP on how they do sequences. So the T2 sequence is the most common, the most stable across all vendors. Flare, diffusion, all these gradient echo images, they're all slightly different, right? And that's why that's why pretty much all AI applications that are designed on MR are done on T2-weighted images because that's the most similar looking sequence across vendors. Um, and, and problem becomes really, really hard because no two vendors have the same flare uh, image looking image, you know, between themselves just because how they have done their IP around it. Um, so I think that's also great ideas, uh, Deepu. I think, uh, you know, there, I'm sure definitely somebody's looking into through those scenarios, but, um, and as I said, you know, nothing's ever, these are, all these thought process and ideas, what creates uh, out of the box thinking around this, right? So, um, um, you know, I would, I would encourage if anybody's here want to try it out to see if that model can work the way you're talking about. Uh, why not? We will learn. We'll find out even if, if it works or doesn't work. Right? We'll get some kind of answer. I mean, we would love to try that out because we have at least some of the reagents, uh, yeah. both at the molecular level as well as at the <clears throat> pathology level. But you know, I would we would need obviously your help or Junaid or somebody to uh, make it uh, somewhat at least test testable. Sure. So, I mean, those are excellent points, Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Khan Siddiqui. Uh, you need a very five big Vs of data. I mean, variety, velocity, et cetera. And then on top of that, you have to have some standardization of data input and then generalizability depends. I mean, clearly it's much easier when you have the Huntsville unit, right? No matter what the CAT scanner is, that's why we can see rapid AI, Viz AI actually being implemented significantly or EKG uh, because at that point in time, there's the electrodiagnostic data from EMG nerve conduction studies is pretty similar because that's a waveform. The minute you actually have have the vari variability of data in such a difference with 1.5 Tesla, 5 Tesla, different vendors, the how the actual you know, data is being extracted, it becomes harder and harder, and you require more and more and more data to actually communicate that. I mean, there's, I mean, medical knowledge by itself doubles every three months, and we are seeing a logarithmic change because it's already at a 
you know, exponential change to an algorithmic change. So this is exciting stuff to be in medicine. And then thanks to Dr. Siddiqui, uh, you know, we, we can see that, you know, if you work through it, stay with it with passion, perseverance, you actually do make not only a difference in your personal financial life, but also to at a greater scale to human life in general. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, our two EC members to quickly, uh, you know, unmute themselves, introduce, and then uh, we'll then end up the, the, the meeting today. Adil, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, Dr. Kalia, thank you so much for this great presentation. So just a brief introduction. Um, I graduated from Dow Medical College back in 2013. Um, I finished my neurology residency and then kind of got excited into um, learning signal processing and artificial intelligence. So I'm currently a neuroengineering PhD student, um, third year right now. And, um, you know, start learning how to code at the age of 30 is difficult, but you're kind of, you know, slowly uh, finding a way or solution to do that. So I will be reaching out to you, Dr. Siddiqui, for, you know, troubleshooting on the ideas. And also when I apply for my K23 award in the future as well. So thank you so much. More than happy to help. Uh, is Tamur still on? Jim, Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Junaid and Dr. Sadiq for the your time. It was very valuable and I learned so many things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything, your time. I'm very grateful to all the members that joined today uh, on this webinar. This will be available on social media. Please make sure you post it and then say thanks to Dr. Sadiq in public on Twitter and LinkedIn so that this word gets out. Make sure you go to Hyperfine website, make sure you download their brochures, make sure you actually forward them to your hospital administrators, make sure you send them to your CEOs, CMOs and everyone so that if they are missing that information, they need to get it out there. So it's extremely important that we support as Dr. Khan has graciously given his time, uh, given his situation. So thank you, thank you again, Dr. Khan, any last words? No, I'm just humbled by you guys asking me to do this. Um, no, you know, it's in, 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 you know, when you're doing all this work, it doesn't feel like you're doing innovative stuff and something new. You're really in the in the weeds of it, trying to solve daily problems. And um, you know, it's very flattering when you get asked to do this stuff. But uh, as you said, you know, it's, it's we are a mission to make a difference in people's life and creating a social impact at the same time. So not only are we growing in the U.S. but also in Pakistan. So. If there's anybody you guys know needs um, MR capability in Pakistan, please um, send them our way also. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Glad you made it to the end. If you save a life, it is as if you saved the life of all mankind. This is my guiding principle. Please do your part. Like, comment, share, and make sure you subscribe to my newsletter and my YouTube channel for future updates. If you want to connect with me, Twitter and LinkedIn is the best place. Feel free to send me a message. Thank you so much.